Okay, here is the big news that I was teasing last week. Since I started working on Fall of Friday in late 2020, it's been pretty much a solo operation. If you listen to the credits every week, and you should, then you know that Yona Marie sings the theme song and Dodi Hermawan draws the illustrations of all of our guests. And I have a couple freelancers who I pay to help me edit the transcripts over on followfridaypodcast.com. But otherwise, it's just been me. Until now. Starting this week, I'm delighted to say that I'm going to have a social media producer. Ironically, for a show about social media, I'm not very good at keeping our social accounts updated, especially Instagram, which I neglect because I'm old and I don't have a personal account there. But all that changes starting today with our social media producer, Sydney. So please go give some love to Follow Friday Pod on Instagram. That's at Follow Friday Pod. Speaking of love, a huge shout out to our lovely patrons over at patreon.com slash follow Friday. Their donations help keep this podcast going, and they also unlock extended length interviews with our guests. You're listening to the public feed of Follow Friday, which means you'll get four follow recommendations from today's wonderful guest, Josh Frulinger. But Josh and I actually talked about a fifth account he loves, and you can hear all about it by going to patreon.com slash follow Friday and pledging any amount, starting at just one dollar. And now, here's the show. Today is a good day to meet some new friends. Hey! Everyone make a way. The show is a buffet of folks you should know. Hey! So let's have a swap. I'm Eric Johnson. Welcome to Follow Friday, the podcast about who you should follow online. Every week, I talk to creative people about who they follow and why. This is a guided tour to the best people on the internet, led by your favorite writers, podcasters, comedians, and more. If this is your first episode of the show, take a moment now and please follow or subscribe in your podcast app. Today on the show is Josh Frulinger, also known as the Comics Curmudgeon. Every day, Josh plucks out the best of the worst newspaper comics and adds his own commentary at joshreads.com. He's also the author of the book The Enthusiast. You can follow him on Twitter at JFRUH. Josh, welcome to Follow Friday. Oh, thank you very much for having me on. So nice to meet you. Uh, you were recommended by a previous guest on this show, Alexandra Petri, and ever since then, I have been reading the Comics Curmudgeon. I've been following you on Twitter, and I want to talk about Comics Curmudgeon to start. Tell me if this was wrong. I think there's three types of comics that you write about. One is comics that are supposed to be funny, but aren't. <laughs> then there's comics that are not supposed to be funny, but they are unintentionally. And then there's the ones that aren't funny in any dimension, but they're doing something kind of interesting. Is that a good way of summing it up? You're the expert on <laughs> this. How'd I do? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, pro- it's probably a fair breakdown of the, of the different types. There are definitely ones that they're trying to be funny. And I, one, of the, one thing that I really feel like I've learned from doing the comics is that uh, humor is very, very culturally specific. And, you know, we often think about that in terms of, like, where you are in history or, like, different cultures. But even, like, within the U.S., just what different people and different subcultures think are funny is very different. So, clearly, the jokes written in the comics are for somebody, but often are not for me. (laughs) So that's one way of looking at it. Then there are definitely ones like the soap opera strips that aren't supposed to be funny, but that I are supposed to be... Like, they're very, a uh, phrase I would use to sort of po-face some of the time, like, they're very supposed to be serious, but I think that, like, the ultimate intention is to be kind of campy, at least in the year 2022. Um, and yeah, and sometimes they are, there are ones that are just kind of weird, and that, like, uh, that are interesting and not uh, amusing at a joke level, per se, but definitely someone is doing something interesting with. I mean, I remember when I was a kid that I would read the comics page, but I would always skip over the soapy strips. I would just like know automatically to ignore Mark Trail or whatever. Although I guess maybe to my detriment, Alexandra was saying there was a storyline involving smuggling drugs and fish. So clearly I I missed out on that. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, Mark Trail is definitely one of those ones that like if you start letting yourself get pulled into it, then you very quickly become like part of its world. I feel like all those all the soap opera strips are like this. And I feel like. 
you know, I didn't really read them as a kid, but I, I moved to someplace. I moved to Maryland in the, in like 2002 and the, the newspaper at the time had like a bajillion soap strips. So it was very, uh, that was when I got sucked in. Right. So since you started really reading the comics religiously, have they been consistently like this or has the shift to more people consuming web comics and other stuff online, has that changed the way the comics look or the way they, they, they are written? Uh, there's a, bunch, a few different answers to that question. I feel like there is a certain amount of, you know, this is true in every creative endeavor and it's not less true for the comics that it, that there is now a shorter circuit between you and your audience, uh, which can result in some weird feedback loops so in Mary Worth, there's a, one of her ancillary characters is this guy, Wilbur Weston, who's this sort of short, bald guy who is irritating on a number of levels. And there was a recent storyline where Wilbur was on a cruise with his girlfriend, who he does not deserve, who had tried to break up with him because he got into a fight with her cat. It's a long story. Anyway, <laughs> that's a classic Mary Worth bit. Uh, and uh, Wilbur, I wouldn't call him an alcoholic, but he, he does have a, a, he is prone to self medicating with alcohol at times. They were on a cruise. He got into a fight, they got into an argument and then he got liquored up and fell off the cruise ship. And oh, no. it was, there was a long stretch of like where people were like Wilbur's dead, but it turned out he had just washed up on a party Island, uh, after we got like a week <laughs> of everyone mourning him. And then he got to show up being like, I'm still alive. Um, and it, it still sloshed, still sloshed. And so that storyline almost felt a little bit like it was baiting Internet people uh, who read Mary Worth, by which I mean me specifically uh, and many yes. of my readers. And so it was one of those things. Where, I mean, clearly I enjoyed it. It was a big moment in Mary Worth fandom, but it was definitely also it sort of like makes you think about it used to be that you kind of were just sending stuff like that out especially i think especially comic strips like you were kind of just sending it out into the world and got an occasional letter to the editor but couldn't get the immediate feedback that you get from it now and i i think that does affect the way they're created now i think some of the other creators are not online at all and god bless them yeah. like I, <laughs> I think they're just doing their thing and like not not paying attention i i can't imagine that any of the the people working at the workshops that create like beetle bailey or garfield uh, know or care what people say online about them. I was going to say, Be- Beetle Bailey seems to be like the perfect example of a, of a strip that is frozen in time. It's just, it has never, ever changed, right? <laughs> well, you know, the funny thing is that's not quite true, but... Really? The, well, the way it has changed in time is like every, let's say, like six to eight years, they realize there's something going on in the world that they need to add a character to address. And so ah. they do... And then that character just sort of sticks around exactly like they they were when they were. So, for instance, in like the 50s, when the so-called rock and roll was coming big, they introduced a character named Rocky, who was their like rebel without a cause guy. And he's just been there ever (laughs) since exactly the same. Wow. They added a black character in the 70s. They added an Asian character in the 90s. um, And they added a computer programmer specialist in like 2003. Uh, and so all those guys are exactly like they were when they were introduced. Um, the black <laughs> character still has a giant afro. The computer guy's name is Chip Gizmo. And uh, clearly none of the people <laughs> writing jokes for him use computers. Uh, so in that sense, it's like a series of frozen in time moments with Beetle Bailey in particular. Yeah. I mean, the, the overall thing about Beetle Bailey, that's a very like talking about being culturally specific that and, and it doesn't really relate is that Beetle Bailey is, is very specifically a product of a period where there was a draft, but there wasn't any war like from mm-hmm. the, basically the, between the Korean and Vietnam war. So you would have a military where there would be people who didn't really want to be there, but also were not really in danger of getting shot at. But however, it of course has continued to exist through huge changes in our society and in how war is fought and how the military works socially and otherwise. So it's a yeah, very exactly. strange comic at this point. And yet it endures, yeah. <laughs> and yet it endures. And if people and if you took it out of the newspapers, the people would complain. And that and because right. like primarily even the people who read those comics, probably a lot of them, if not a majority, read them online. Like it's for the most part, it's the newspapers that are paying the syndicates for them. So it's the people who read the newspapers who they care about most. 
So, you know, if the shrinking and aging newspaper demographic specifically doesn't like your comic, then you're in trouble, even if you are popular online. So <laughs> if you lost the over 80 set, then you've lost the whole ballgame. Yeah, <laughs> seriously, seriously. Like those are the people who are going to get mad. And, and you know, there's definitely been things when like the comics page is a fascinating from an economic standpoint. Uh, it's like the only job in America that you can just give to your children hmm. because it'll be like. So like the, you know, obviously these people have been working remotely for decades. They 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 write it and work in their workshops or their homes, and they send it to the syndicate. And so it is super not uncommon for the creator to be like, "Oh, hey, uh, is it okay if my son takes over the strip?" By the way, my son has been writing and drawing this for the last ten years, and I just didn't tell you. <laughs> So it would be weird for you to say no at this point. And, and, or, or sometimes it goes from the person to the, their assistants. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, it depends. Some comics are still owned by the creators or the creators, families or the creators LLC that they created at some point. Uh, and then some of them are owned by the syndicate and the syndicates just sort of hire people to do the gags and the drawing. And that's a little different dynamic, but right. Just keep the IP alive. Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so yes, it's, it is wild that apparently some of these strips are still making enough money that they can hire, you know, workshops of people and, and multiple people work on it. And some of them are just sort of like labors of love of one person. All right. Well, let us uh, briefly escape from the newspaper comics oh, and yeah. go online, the place where the Beetle Bailey artists dare not venture <laughs> and find out who Josh Frulinger follows. You can follow along with us today. Every person he recommends will be linked in the show notes and in the transcript at followfridaypodcast.com. It's Final Friday. Josh, before the show, I gave you a list of categories and I asked you to tell me four people you follow who fit in those categories. Your first pick is in the category, someone who's an expert in a very specific niche that you love. And you said Numble, which is on Twitter at N-U-M-B-L-E. And their bio says, I read LA Metro documents for fun. So to start off, why don't you explain what Numble does and, and why you love it? Okay, so I, for background on me and why specifically I love this is I live in Los Angeles uh, and I don't drive, so it's which is a sort of unusual combination. Um, Impressive. I have a driver's license. I had a whole series of uh, accidents and near accidents in my late teens and early twenties, and I was like, maybe this isn't for me. And so I, you know, my wife has a car. We have a car together, so it's not like I never am in a car. But when I get around by myself, it's often by public transit in L.A., which is, I always tell people, it's not as bad as you think. People are like, no one takes the bus in L.A. I'm like, actually, a million people take the bus in L.A. every single day. Huh. But uh, it's not as good as it could or should be. Uh, it's not a great public transit city. Uh, and so Numble is this guy. Is I say guy, but I don't know. Numble is a person who uh, all they, their entire persona on Twitter is they find documents from L.A. Metro, which is the, the, uh, the county agency that runs the public transit in Los Angeles County. They are very laser focused on this. They, you can get a sense of their personality through some of their commentary and stuff, but it's really not clear, are they a Metro operator? Are they within Metro somehow? All the stuff they find is publicly accessible, but it's often mm -hmm. in very obscure corners of the Metro website. And so a lot of what they post is like, so L.A., to its credit, is, is trying to expand and improve its public transit network in a lot of ways. And there are multiple construction projects going on right now, all of which at this point are quite delayed. They will find like, oh, here's some documents talking about like why, what, when is this, when is this line going to open? Like what are the, how much money are we making from this tax that we voted for ourselves to fund public transit? What are the priorities? What are the problem? One of the big problems they're having now is that they can't hire enough bus drivers mm. just because it's, you know, it's a sort of thankless job and it doesn't pay great. They have goals of like how many, how often buses are supposed to come and they can't meet them because they don't have enough operators. So I sometimes wonder if Numble is a, a bus, an operator in lingo, a bus driver, because the profile picture is a person sitting behind the wheel of a bus looking with like some documents unfolded on the wheel. But that also just could be like some random picture they took of a bus driver. So I don't know. And, and you said that you got you can get a sense of their personality from the way that they tweet. What, what do you mean by that? Like, are they angry about the state of transportation? Are they funny about it? Like, how do you describe their personality? I don't know if this really counts as a personality. People, including myself, have been accused of making public transit their personality online. Um, I would say that they are interested in L.A. having a better public transit system than it does, but are also kind of a little bit detached and amused by some of the floundering that goes on to make that happen. 
One of the running bits is that, so there's the Crenshaw line, which is a new line that's going to be running out by the airport, uh, was supposed to open in, I believe, 2019 uh, and has, and now the best guess is hopefully it will be open by the end of this year. And so whenever they post the updated construction reports, there's always like a point, like it's been 99% done for like a year and a half. Um, and every report is usually by the time it's made public, it's like a few weeks old. And so every report has like, we expect to hand it over to Metro for testing on this date. And then number will say is they did not hand it over for testing on that date, which is a fact, (laughs) but all, but the fact that he, they say it the same way every single time is now just sort of this running joke. Anyway, so that's that's sort of that kind of way. I mean, it's, it's obviously like it's a person who I follow very closely and therefore feel like I know, but obvi- don't know anything about really. Like that's sort of the, one of the things I find interesting about them is how anonymous they are. Like when I started my blog, I actually didn't put anything about myself on it. And I, I really thought I was going to be this very, like had this idea I was going to do it very anonymously. That lasted like, I think, five weeks. And then I was like, oh, no, I got to start posting about myself. So and now my face is on it. So, yeah, it, it's, it's difficult to write around yourself in, in that way yeah i, I get yeah. that yeah mm-hmm. um the, I, i'm up in san francisco and our version of the crenshaw line is the i, I just looked up the official name the van ness improvement project it's oh, a bus yeah. lane you, you know about this it's famous i guess <laughs> oh yeah, yeah i used to i lived in the bay area years ago so i, I sort of okay. keep up on it I keep up on the public transit worldwide, but you know that exactly. Yes. Yeah, this is a bus lane that they have been building for about ten years. It's 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 a it's a lane of the highway painted red that, uh, as of this recording, I don't think is still open to buses. But it looks it's it's finally getting there. I I think I think within the next decade they they will have it. <laughs> I actually read it's supposed to be opening by the end of the week. I think or the end of the month. Pretty. Oh soon. my god. By the time this podcast drops, then the, 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 it may be open. Okay, well, my mockery will be in vain. You might be taking those Van Ness lines. What about the <laughs> what about the uh, the, the lines out um out to the the Richmond the uh, the Geary Street lines? Also, is a thing that's been working on forever. Yeah, I think at one point they were trying to build a new connecting streetcar line, and they built it pretty much all the way, and then they realized they had the wrong size railing, so they had to, to rip it all up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's that's about right. Yeah. In my previous life as as a tech podcast producer, I got to meet your mayor, Eric Garcetti, in L.A., uh-huh. and he was saying at the time, this was several years ago, that he was talking about transit and he was really excited about the Hyperloop, Elon Musk's uh, future oh, tunnel Eric project Garcetti. thing. I, I, oh my God, no. I am telling from from that sigh that you oh. maybe are not the biggest fan of Hyperloop. <laughs> no, I mean, it's it, like the it is the thing that's I mean, I could go on a great length about this that to, to bore everybody. But like the, the thing is just like there's nothing about train technology that is difficult or hard or new. But yeah, it can move like thousands of people very quickly. And like, why do you want like the Hyperloop stuff moves fewer people I don't think it's particularly cheaper to build. Like, it, there's just nothing. Yeah, I mean, and you know, they can't. They haven't even really built it. Like, Elon Musk was going to build one for the Las Vegas Convention Center. He ended up building a tunnel that Teslas drive through. It's a matter of like the geometry of like how many people can you move. I'm not going to say that like the way that we build public transit in this country is works because it clearly does not. The thing that's most frustrating is that, like, in Europe, they build it so much. Europe, a place that is not known for having, like, low labor costs or, like, low anything like that, like, builds it much cheaper. And people in the U.S. just, like, won't learn from it. They're, like, no, they're, you never hear about people going over there to figure out, like, well, how do you guys do things? And they're just like, well, that's different. Or they're just different. I got the chance to go to the World Expo uh, earlier this year in Dubai, and we went to the the China Pavilion where they were bragging about you know this year building thirty new high speed rail lines across the country, and we, and you know we were saying like boy it'd be great to have high speed rail and democracy. I I really feel like we should right? be able to have both, but apparently well, it's I mean, an either or situation. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you, I mean you can like the, you know again like France is a country that is building tons of high speed rail. Like Spain built a yeah. bunch of high speed rail. Spain is like I you know. I always like, like at, in my sort of like lefty social democrat heart, I always feel like not to pick on Belgium, but I feel like you could argue with Americans by saying like, are you saying we can't do the things that Belgium does like yeah. in any things <laughs> like, like, come on, come on. Like Belgium has universal health care and we can't. Are we going to let Belgium show us up that way? Come on. Come on. Yeah. No offense <laughs> to my, our Belgian listeners, but like, yeah. 
<laughs> well, anyway, that, that was Numble, which is on Twitter at N-U-M-B-L-E. It's Final Friday. Josh, let's move on to your next follow. I asked you for someone you have followed forever, and you said Katie Natopoulos, who is on Twitter at K-A-T-I-E Natopoulos, N-O-T-O-P-O-U-L-O-S. I think I spelled that right. Yeah. Uh, Katie's a reporter at BuzzFeed News, and you told me that you've been following her work since, I think, before she was at BuzzFeed, since the 2000s. Explain what you associated her with before she was a, a journalist. So in like the, I want to say like the mid aughts, have we, have we settled on aughts as like the name of what that knit decade I think is called? Okay. Yeah, the 2000s. So in, in, yeah, yeah. So in the middle of the 2000s, the aughts, or we even called it, the, I, I, there were just like, this was sort of the high point of blogs before really social media took off. And I, you know, you would find a blog and put it in your, your RSS reader for your old, pe- old people out there for, uh, uh, you know. So I, I don't even remember how I found them, but it was just like a collection of blogs that were sort of like what I was saying about like they were very anonymous they were one they were only about one thing and the, the person didn't really reveal, reveal much about themselves and there there were quite a few the two that I remember best were sorry I missed your party which was it was all uh Flickr pictures I don't remember Flickr like you used, used to be able to post and they would encourage you to post in a way that would make them shareable for non-commercial purposes Katie uh, who's the person behind this would find the most goofy pictures and and post them Sometimes with a caption, sometimes not. And then there was another one that was, was called Bad Questions for Yahoo Answers, which you, <laughs> for those of you who remember Yahoo Answers, it was sort of a proto Quora, which was even dumber. One of the most famous Yahoo questions was uh, how is Bebby formed, I think has become a sort of legendary <laughs> meme. Uh, and I think maybe that might have been first on Katie's blog. Wait, Katie is the one who popularized how is Babby formed? Don't hold me to that. I it, okay. it seems like the sort of thing that would have been on her blog, um, but it, it might have also gone viral in other ways. Yeah. But eventually, after a while, I started to realize that these were all from the same person. And I, I, I cannot remember how that detect- she might have actually just sort of made it clear at some point. But I was like, oh, this makes mm-hmm. sense. Um, yeah. And then she, you know, went on to BuzzFeed and she did a lot of great internet culture stuff on BuzzFeed. Uh, one of my very favorite things, an article that should have won the Pulitzer that year was, so on the Wikipedia article for grinding the dance, there is a truly amazing picture that is, that just has extremely powerful, like Bush era energy of like (laughs) some people standing up on a bar sort of grinding on each other. And like, oh my god, I just found the photo. <laughs> oh yeah, it's still there. And one of them is wearing like a Jamiroquai hat and like clearly <laughs> I think I if I'm remembering right, like some of their eyes are sort of like have that flash, like it's this clearly taken with a flash photo of then and, and anyway, she found all those people and like wrote an article that was basically like a, a behind the music of that photo. Um, and it was incredible. I think it's just called like an oral history of the grinding article on Wikipedia. The definitive oral history of the Wikipedia photo for grinding. (laughs) Yes, that's it. That's it. So she really has sort of that. She's a person I followed on the internet, but also has like a sort of relation with the internet, uh, that I, I really appreciate. And yeah, and she used to post a lot on Twitter and now she doesn't, uh, presumably because, uh, she has become more mentally healthy than I am. And, uh, uh, yeah. So, but I think she still writes for Buzzfeed. Um, weirdly I also found out, but when I moved to LA that like my wife's cousin is, was like one of her best friends in college. Uh, and so I always keep waiting for her to come up. I know it's very weird. So I'm like, maybe someday she'll come out and visit and I'll finally meet her. But anyway, <laughs> she's someone I filed forever. And, and I think I also put her in the category as people who should come back. She hasn't not, she doesn't like disappeared forever, but I do wish she would post more, but um, you know, yeah. I get it. I get it. She's got other stuff going on. Some balance in your life. And I can't spend all day on Twitter, just 23 hours. Right. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. But no, I, I started following Katie later than you when she and friend of the show, Ryan Broderick were hosting a podcast called internet explorer. Um, a oh, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. internet culture podcast. Yeah. You know, it. um, I do and, know it, yes. and she and Ryan and their colleagues, they would do also do these lists for Buzzfeed every year about the worst things on the internet of the of yes. that year, which was, <laughs> Oh God, they were all very one bad. of the best things. They, they were disgusting and they were cringeworthy and it was expertly curated. I, I really am, am, was always impressed by her and, and you know, her colleagues, what, what they were able to, to dig up online. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Are there any other specific projects or stories that you remember that the Katie's been involved with that really jumped out at you as like, oh, wow, this is really a important voice on the Internet stuff, stuff that you really liked of hers? Um, 
I mean, I, that's sort of the high point. I feel like there was one time where, a couple times more recently where she's been like, it's not like, I wouldn't call it a stunt. It doesn't go far, but it's sort of like, like this, like I remember when, when Facebook had their appliance where that you were, that was going to let you do video chatting through Facebook and, um, or, and she, or I think she would have done the glasses too. She basically was like, here's this thing everyone's been making fun of because it's terrible. I'm going to use it and tell you how it goes. And like, yeah. And she did it in a very interesting way of like simultaneously, uh, engaging with it, like on its own terms as an object that you might use, but also sort of being aware of like the larger context of like Facebook being kind of a terrible company and like, why on earth would you want to do this? Right. So I thought those were kind of interesting. <laughs> the, the, the headline of, of her article, I think this is the, the review you're talking about is I love Facebook's video chatting device because I'm drunk on dumb bitch juice. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, that's that. That's right. That sounds right. I think she I, she might have done. I wish I'm. I hope I'm not getting this completely wrong. Like she might have done one is like I love this and no one should use it. That might be another one. I think you're right. Yeah. But yeah, uh, a, a recent thing that she tweeted that is is right up your alley is uh, she says trying to think of a similar IP to Garfield that is so widely beloved, yet its actual canon, the Daily Strips, are so bad. <laughs> <laughs> I assume uh, this, this is you probably have opinions on, on on this tweet here but uh, uh f- full disclosure i i was i was i was the garfield kid i was the one in elementary school who had all the little collected books of, of garfield comic strips i was obsessed for, for for many years so i cannot i cannot take any moral superiority here <laughs> <laughs> well i you know the thing about garfield that's interesting is that i do think it is a perfect machine aimed specifically at like nine to eleven year olds yeah it, it's not for me and I'm okay with that. It's like, uh, it, it, I don't know how to describe it. It's like perfectly for like, you're learning what sort of sarcasm is and Garfield is kind of sassy and sarcastic, but it's still like, it's still fine. I was on the, I actually was on the bus the other day and there was a, mo- a mom and her son who was about nine sitting in the seats in front of me. And he was reading uh, of like a, a Garfield collection that like clearly was taken out of the library and he had like mm-hmm. several of them. And it just, Oh, it warmed my heart that he was like, this is great. And like in five years, you're going to be like Garfield's dumb and it's for babies. And then in 20 <laughs> years, you're going to be like Garfield was pretty good for my, me when I was nine. So <laughs> exactly. Well, last thing I had written down here about Katie was that recently she's been doing a lot of reporting about cryptocurrency, NFTs, yes. Board Ape Yacht Club, and a lot of other things that I'm sick of hearing about. But uh, <laughs> the, the, the harsh truth, though, is there's a lot of money flying around, a lot of big cultural players, so I kind of feel like I should pay attention to all this stuff, and I think it's good that someone like Katie is taking it seriously, is reporting on it. Are you following any of this any of this stuff or, or at least katie's coverage of it um yes i'm actually minting my own a uh, coin based on garfield i'm gonna drop this knowledge <laughs> no i'm i'm not i'm i'm following it to the extent that i like i can read about it to the extent that it makes me not recoil um it's probably something i should get over but it i just it just all seems so dumb and pointless to me you know i've been I love that they're calling it Web 3. Like, I've been around the web since, like, Web 1 or possibly Web 0. It just definitely seems like like there is a core of the technology that is, I'm sure is useful for something. But it just seems like so much of it is just is just money sloshing around and becoming, like, literally a pyramid scheme of, like, people putting money in. And, like, you just need to be more people to keep the money in so that you, you can get your money out eventually. Um, I have not read Katie's stuff about it. I'm sure it's great. Be, I, just because it just makes me mad reading about it. And, uh, you know, presumably <laughs> I'm going to get a bunch of emails about this telling me how I'm wrong and, and uh, or whatnot. But uh, I don't care. I don't care. Sorry. <laughs> Good. Be brave. Hold that ground. Hold that fort. <laughs> 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 that was Katie Natopoulos, who was on Twitter at Katie Natopoulos. We are going to take a quick break now, but we'll be back in a minute with the comics curmudgeon, Josh Frulinger. Today's show is brought to you by Lightning Pod, which is the podcast studio behind Follow Friday, but we also help other podcasters too. Whether you're starting a new podcast or you want help with an existing show, Lightning Pod can help you with editing, copywriting, website design, interviewing technique, improving your audio quality, and so much more. We've worked with everyone from solo creators to startups to huge established companies, so check us out at lightningpod.fm. 
That's lightningpod.fm. It's Follow Friday. Welcome back to Follow Friday. Josh, let's move on to your next follow. I asked you for someone you're jealous of, and you said Annie Warwerda, who is on Twitter at A-N-N-I-I-E-R-A-U. I had not heard of Annie before, but I could tell right away that I'm going to get hooked on a project of hers that she runs called Depths of Wikipedia. It's on Twitter at Depths of Wiki and on Instagram and TikTok at Depths of Wikipedia. And do you want to explain this project? Yeah, so Annie basically is someone who is a Wikipedia obsessive, which I very strongly identify with. And, uh, and you know, it's, it, it is not complicated. She finds the weirdest and funniest stuff and surfaces it and talks about it. And it's great. She has a, a, a very funny attitude, a very funny take on it. She does do some digging. I actually found out, it's not, not unlike Katie's deep dive into the grinding photo, uh, another very classic Wikipedia photo is the people on, I think it's the high five page who are acting out the like high five down low too slow sequence. Right. Yes. She tracked them down. Like it's probably like 15, 20 years later and found out that at the time they were in a sort of ambiguous romantic relationship and now they broke up and now they're married and they, they reproduced the sequence for her on her TikTok. And so, Oh my God. (laughs) Yeah. So just to, in terms of like, you know, framing it of someone that you're, uh, what's the word? How did you put it? Someone you're jealous of. So my friend Connor Lestoka and I, for a while, had a Tumblr uh, that was called Citation Needed. And it was uh, it was basically every entry, it was like, we're doing this as a zero commentary bit. Like everyone was just like a quote from Wikipedia that was patently absurd. And it, it was popular for a while. Uh, we did some quickie, like self-published books out of it. But, you know, and then we sort of lost interest. So Annie is sort of doing Wikipedia, surfacing w- ridiculous Wikipedia content for the new age. And uh, i uh, slightly jealous that she's the one who gets to do it. But also she's like very conversant in Instagram and, and TikTok in a way that I'm not. And so I'm very glad that she's doing it. And shes it's getting very popular. It's fun. So I'm in a, a Facebook group that is not related to her that's called Cool Freaks Wikipedia Club. That is kind of the same I idea. used to be in that. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And so uh, I, I learned about her because a p- couple people posted things like a couple articles and someone would be like, you're just copying what's on Depths of Wikipedia. So clearly <laughs> she is an influencer within the Wikipedia obsessive community. And I, uh, I appreciate and respect that. So this may be obvious to folks who like, like us who, who have spent a lot of time on Wikipedia, but maybe if you could, since, since you have some experience here, <laughs> wh- why do you think it is that Wikipedia has such a specific idiom or a specific tendency to get into the these things that can be made fun of if, if that makes sense um no I, it can is so wikipedia is i i sincerely think simultaneously think that wikipedia is a really valuable resource in most cases is as good or better than what would have been in an ordinary printed wikipedia and also just has like almost limitless amounts of nonsense and insanity. It's like, it's, it is, it's kind of interesting. And I, I, to my pet theory about it is that one of the biggest reasons is that it, there's no limits on how much you can have on Wikipedia. So it, it encourages people to be able to create articles about any topic they want, including topics that would not normally get an encyclopedic treatment and then treat them with the seriousness that an encyclopedia deserves. Even if the, the, right. the subjects themselves are strange or absurd. And so there's a certain kind of idiom to it that is a a kind of very serious voice uh, and scholarly voice that is captured with varying degrees of fidelity by different editors. Like some people are not good at it at all, but they're almost always trying, which is very endearing to me that like sometimes they're working toward an encyclopedic voice, even when the subject matter is ridiculous. And even if they're not particularly great writers, um, yeah. you know, they're doing they're often doing what in their mind is a, a sort of ponderous and, and smart person voice, even if it doesn't really come across that way. Um, and of course, a lot of them are, are pulling from what's in other Wikipedia articles. So it becomes a sort of like feedback loop of like, what's it like? Right. And, and of course, Wikipedia is full of drama because there's like deletionists and completionists. There are people who are very strict about like, I don't think this deserves a Wikipedia article. And there are some people who are, you know really think it does. Uh, it's f- a fun fact is that, so the, I have a Wikipedia. I, I shouldn't say it. There's a Wikipedia article for the comics curmudgeon, which if you put my name in, it redirects it to. And it has been 
deleted at least twice and then recreated. And then there have been frequent, uh, not frequent is a strong word, but there have been not, not insignificant number of attempts to request deletion, which have failed. <laughs> and I have never been, you know, following the rules of Wikipedia. I have never edited my own article and I've never participated in it, but of course I watch it and I'm constantly sort of amused by seeing every once in a while the drama that, that flares up around it. It's been a while since anyone's tried to delete it, so I guess I'm okay. Or either that or they stopped caring about me, one of the two things. I, I, I just checked. So the sections are content, impact, awards. I don't, I don't, I don't think there's any, uh, there's no personal life section. There, there's no uh, controversy or criticism section. So I, I think right. you're doing okay for yourself. <laughs> there was a point where there was more about me personally that I think got deleted. And someone was mm. basically like, this is about the blog, not the person. I'm like, I respect that. It's fine. No one needs yeah. to know that I was on Jeopardy in 2008. That, why, why would you care about that? It, not, not interesting to this blog. I, I saw that on your website. You, you have the, the answer to like one of the questions you missed on, on your website. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Gold in my ear. Should have known it. It was the final Jeopardy, but you know, oh, say lovey. <laughs> yeah. Have you seen the uh, store, the online store for that Annie has made for, for Depths of Wikipedia? I I have. I'm trying to remember what the sort of stuff is. What sort of stuff is on it? I was looking at this earlier. The weird. Oh, I'm looking at it. Yeah, weird Wikipedia products. Uh huh. It's the depths of Wikipedia.com. And I already have too many mugs, but I almost bought like four mugs from the, from this <laughs> store. <laughs> it's I would highly recommend going to it. This the bisexual lighting mug is skeleton is good. They have a mug for high five variations with the original photos of the, yeah, of the yeah. couple doing up high, down low. <laughs> uh, victim misses too slow with finger guns. <laughs> this is sort of like one of the things about Wikipedia, of course, that encourages this kind of stuff is that it, it is all. Uh, it's all licensed in order to contribute to Wiki, Wikipedia. You have to license it to be reused by whoever wants to use it. It's a very open source mm-hmm. in that way. So yes, you can just, if you wanted to, you could print out all of Wikipedia and sell it to somebody. Um, or you could make a, a mug featuring the, uh, the the bisexual lighting skeleton and uh, and sell it on a, on a page and no one can stop you. I met someone online. There are some, some really interesting old photos on Wikipedia that are like from the 70s. And I'm like, it's not really clear about what the copyright status is. But there's, I think there's a picture of, I think it might be on the Halloween page of a kid, a little kid dressed as a skeleton that's very kind of creepy and evocative. And uh, I'm going to see if I can find it because I, I would like to find it. Anyway, I somehow ran into the person online who that's a picture of. And he said that he's like a big fan of that fact. It, it's like um, that he's met people who have tattoos of it. <laughs> of that specific photo of that specific photo i'll find the picture for you and send it to you after the after please this. do if, if, if you find the history. link we'll put it in the the show notes and in the transcript yeah all right well that was annie rawerda the creator of depths of wikipedia which is on twitter at depths of wiki and on instagram and tiktok at depths of wikipedia it's final friday we have time for one more follow today i think i saved the best for last josh i asked you for someone you just started following and you said WHH haters posting their L's online, which is on Twitter at W3H's LS online. And so some context, if you don't know this meme, there's lots of novelty accounts about people's wins and losses, W's and L's, uh, usually screenshots of those people winning or losing internet arguments or maybe saying something that reveals their own shortcomings if it's an L. So, so Josh, who are the WHH haters and, and why are they posting their L's? Well, the people who are WHHH haters are people who needlessly hate on our ninth president, William Henry Harrison. How could they? Uh, who you might remember as the guy who caught pneumonia because he refused to wear an overcoat during his inaugural dress in the pouring rain and died 30 <laughs> days after he was elected, both destroying his reputation uh, you know, making it so that that's the only thing anyone remembered about him. Also elevating his vice president, John Tyler, to be president, who is undoubtedly one of the worst presidents in American history. Mm-hmm. Um, the only American president who later served in the Confederate, the Congress of the Confederacy, managed to alienate both his party and the opponent. Anyway, point is, William Henry Harrison gets a bad rap, but this Twitter feed tries to restore his reputation by engaging in vicious fights against his non-existent haters who I, I think we can assume <laughs> there's, not a, there's not a ton of active anti-William Henry Harrison haters on the internet, but he will definitely find them and yell at them uh, and also do a lot of memes about William Henry Harrison. 
the other the thing about William Henry Harrison is that, of course, he's like many uh, 19th century white men. He wasn't a great guy, slave owner, Indian genocider, et cetera, et cetera. But he he happened to have a good enemy who was Andrew Jackson, who was probably even worse. Uh, so there there is a lot of anti Andrew Jackson content on this feed as well, <laughs> uh, and also a lot of like pro uh, Whig party because Harrison was the first uh, first uh, president elected for the Whigs, uh, so a lot of pro Whig uh, propaganda. Uh, of course, which, you know it's always sort of fun because it's like you know we sort of are so married to like our what our current set of political concerns are, and obviously they are very important. But it is kind of interesting to remember that there are periods in history where the partisanship was just as intense and it was about things that like nobody cares about now. Like, should we be building canals into the Midwest? Like the Whigs <laughs> cared a lot about it and people got really riled up. And now we're like, I guess, maybe, I don't know. <laughs> so yeah, I'm a big I'm a big fan of it. It, it. it just seemed it like like you said, it's it's definitely based on the sort of meme type of account where it'll be like men posting their L's or like conservatives posting their L's online. And, and sort of putting a, a very funny spin on it. Yeah. When it's also, it's kind of a parody of people who, there, there's some folks on social media and Twitter specifically who they do what's called name searching. I think a controversial practice yes. where you are looking for your own name for tweets that are about you when you're not mentioned. So basically when the, when the tweeter didn't necessarily want you to see that they were talking about you. Right. They didn't tag you. Yeah, they don't tag you. And so, so here's a recent tweet from from, from uh, WHH haters. I sometimes search William Henry Harrison's name, and all I see is he died in office, and he was a war criminal. And I think about no matter how big our following is, our work will never be done. I think we need missionaries or something to get to these people before they do. <laughs> yeah, it, it, and like I'm sure if you follow, if you search for William Henry Harrison on on Twitter, all you'll find is people talking about how he died in 30 days, and that is that is he. This guy will retweet a lot of those things yeah. and yell at them. So I respect yep. it. <laughs> So did you have a particular attachment to WHH before you found this account? <laughs> did you have any particular feelings about him? I mean, I, I'm into history, so I, I knew a little bit about him. But like most people, I think the primary thing I knew about him was that he died after 30 days in office in a kind of stupid way. I'm sorry, WHHH Ella's online anonymous tweeter, but I, I, he should have worn a coat. He should have worn a coat. <laughs> if his, you know, he's an he was an old man, and like it was raining, and his speech was very long. It's like a two-hour-long speech, yeah. <laughs> it was a very, very long speech, um, and uh, and yeah, that, and there has been some like I heard there was some sort of controversy about like maybe it wasn't actually pneumonia. Uh, I have not followed this up, so I could be wrong. But um, anyway, the point is that no, I didn't really think that much about William Henry Harrison before doing before following this Twitter, and now I only think of him as in terms of like someone being mad at uh, Andy Jackson, which I support, and also occasionally promoting Whig ideology, which I'm like, why not bring back the Whigs? I like canals. Does Ohio need more yeah. canals? Maybe. Only one way to find out. <laughs> Start digging, yeah. <laughs> That's right, exactly. I mean, canals, you know, canal infrastructure is just the ancestor of public transit in LA. It's all connected, you know? They're like the soys of the sea. Let's call them that. Yeah, exactly. There is, you know, <laughs> actually in Venice, Venice, California, the reason it's called that is because there were originally a bunch of canals that they built, ho built houses next to. Uh, now almost huh. all of them have been filled in, but there are still a few. Huh. Wow. I had no idea. <laughs> But yeah, I like I like the um, meta joke of this account, which is just how everything can become an argument on the internet. Yes, you know, just as, yes. as you're saying, they they they're they're digging up these tweets about people just making jokes and you know quote tweeting them, putting them on blast. And I would hope that this may give followers some pause about whatever fights they are choosing to start online. <laughs> yeah. Like one of one of the things that he constantly retweets is there's you know in the there's a Simpsons where I don't even remember the context within The Simpsons, but they they go to, I think they're maybe at Disney and they go to the Hall of the Lesser Presidents. And, <laughs> uh, and then there's, they, there's a musical review and one guy's like, there's William Henry Harrison, I died in 30 days. And so he always will post like big accounts that are supposedly screenshotting this. <laughs> Even though, of course, they're not really. So he has one of like Joe Biden supposedly screenshotting it. And he's like, weird, I'm sure that's a coincidence. And then showing that like like Martin Van Buren, Joe Biden is a Democrat. Um, so, <laughs> Oh, my God, it's amazing. I just this is one of those things where, where I just I'm so glad 
that the internet is weird sometimes, that someone is committed to this bit where they, they are just every day in the trenches defending William yes. Henry Harrison. Just <laughs> what a good use of their time. I always wonder, like, how long can this bit go on with these? Because there would right. be a certain point. Where it was like, like I, I'm looking at the account now, and I can see it was started in, in September 2021. Which I'm like, Damn, this is like, like that's almost six months at this point. That's a pretty good run for something like this. For me, like I've been doing my blog for like more than 15 years, and I'm like, that's way too long to be doing it. But I'm gonna keep doing it till they stop making comics. So you know, I respect, <laughs> I respect someone who commits. That's all I'm gonna say. And then after that, you can you can move on to to web comics. You know, you can go go dive dive into the history of <laughs> <laughs> over dramatic web comics. <laughs> exactly, exactly. All right. Well, that was W H H haters posting their L's online, which is on Twitter at W H H H L S online. Josh, thank you so much for sharing all these follows with us today. Before we go, let's make sure that listeners know how to find you online. Where do you want them to follow you? Well, uh, you can go to my blog, which is at joshreads.com. If you just want comics content, that's all I do there. Uh, If you want my every thought that I ever have, uh, you can go to Twitter, which is jfru, J-F-R-U-H, as my Twitter account. And you can, I will also post links there to things that I write. And also, I, I also, I do a live uh, stand-up show in Los Angeles that's called The Internet Read Aloud. Um, I don't know when this one's going out. It, it, I have one on April 1st. It's on the first uh, Friday of every month. Uh, so that's at the clubhouse in Las Feliz. So I'll, I'll post links to that there. Uh, and if you mostly just want to see pictures of the feral cats that I feed that live in my backyard, you can go to uh, Josh Reeves on Instagram. Perfect. Follow me on Twitter at HeyHeyESJ, and don't forget to follow or subscribe to Follow Friday in your podcast app. If you like this episode, then check out the past Follow Friday interviews with Broti Gupta from The Simpsons, Ryan Broderick from Garbage Day, and Samir Mizrahi from Zillow Gone Wild. Follow Friday is a production of lightningpod.fm, hosted and produced by me, Eric Johnson. Our theme song was performed by Yona Marie, our show art was illustrated by Dodi Hermerwan, and our social media producer is Sydney Grodin. Special thanks to our Big Fry Patreon backers, John and Justin. Visit patreon.com slash follow Friday for an extended length version of this interview featuring a bonus follow recommendation from Josh Frulinger. That's all for this week. This is Eric Johnson reminding you to talk about people behind their backs. And when you do, (laughs) say something nice. See you next Friday.